President Trump has named his pick for Treasury Secretary, one of the most important roles in the government. And it is a homosexual former Democrat donor who worked for George Soros. Wait, what? What was that? Actually, maybe the craziest part of it all is that he seems like actually a pretty solid pick. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. Don Jr. and Elon Musk are talking about buying MSNBC. We'll get to that in a moment. I need someone to bring me my briefcase, by the way, for my audition for MSNBC. I need that. At some point in my show, someone needs to bring me my briefcase. We'll get to that story a little later. First, so if you haven't heard, our best deal of the year is happening right now. Get 50% off new annual memberships. No code needed. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe to join now. I also can't wait to tell you about Policy Genius. Go to policygenius.com slash Knowles. As conservatives, we understand the importance of planning ahead and taking personal responsibility for your family's future. That is why I trust Policy Genius. Policy Genius makes finding and buying life insurance simple and straightforward. They let you compare quotes from America's top insurers side by side with no hidden fees or liberal bureaucracy. They're licensed agents, real Americans, by the way, help you through the entire process. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options are 100% online and let you avoid unnecessary medical exams. I want my family protected no matter what happens. I know you do too. Whether it's covering the mortgage, taking care of education costs, or ensuring your loved ones maintain their standard of living, Policy Genius helps you secure your future. Secure your family's tomorrow so that you have peace of mind today. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Knowles, or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That is policygenius.com slash Knowles, policygenius.com slash Canada, W-L-E-S. All right, before I get to MSNBC, before I get to the Treasury Secretary pick, before I get to all the news, uh, there's a pick that really came out of left field. Uh, President Trump has named his Surgeon General, and the woman that he's named to be Surgeon General is a woman who is a Fox News contributor, and she is most famous for pushing masks on kids and defending social media censorship of so-called COVID disinformation, most of which turned out to be correct information, and the actual disinformation was coming from the public health authorities. This woman, uh, Jeanette Neshawat. And what it is now, COVID, you know, this new Delta variant hits right before school starts. And our top priority should be getting kids back into the classroom, but doing so safely. Here's the problem. Delta is different. And that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending that if you're going to be in a classroom, in a crowded classroom, then you want to protect yourself, wear a mask. Because a lot of kids, for example, under the age of 12, they can't be vaccinated. So it's important to point out, though, masking is not the only solution. We also need to make sure that we have good ventilation, that people are washing their hands, that they're getting tested, and that all the teachers are getting vaccinated as well. But what's happening is this new Delta variant, it replicates more easily and it's more contagious. You can have up to a thousand times more viral particles so kids can pick it up. Even though they may not have severe symptoms, they can spread it to another person. And when it spreads is when the virus mutates. And that's when we get more variants like Delta and Lambda and the UK variant. Okay, I I hope that this episode of my show isn't taken down for all of the misinformation that that woman was just spreading there. Notice she says it, it was... It was the Delta variant that she was talking about. So this is well into the whole COVID epidemic. This is well into the point when when people who had functioning faculties of reason knew that the masks didn't really do anything to stop the spread of the virus, knew that the masks didn't really do anything to reduce the seriousness of the virus. This was well after we knew that kids weren't really all that affected by the virus. Uh, This is crazy stuff. Advocating for for masking, mandatory masking of the kids all the way into COVID. That's just completely insane. And then what's perhaps even more egregious, she went on Fox News and defended the big tech companies, the left-wing big tech companies who were censoring conservatives using the excuse of so-called COVID 
misinformation. First of all, vaccines save lives. And I am so excited and I thank and I commend Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg for taking action because this affects everyone. This affects our children. It affects adults. I mean, just look at the recent measles outbreak, the biggest outbreak that we've had in decades with measles. And, and that's no joke. Measles can cause brain inflammation and pneumonia and ear infections and hearing loss and death. So it's about time that they are taking action. And I hope and pray that other social media platforms will follow suit and do the same thing okay so now so our surgeon general pick is one who spreads a bunch of false information about the most significant public health crisis of the last 20 years and then who defends leftist companies for censoring conservatives based on sometimes often false premises oh yikes man that's bad now you might say Well, look, it's the Surgeon General. Who cares? It's a trivial post. It is a relatively trivial post. That's why there's a good chance President Trump was barely, if at all, involved in this pick. You know, there are a lot of people he's got to fill up in the government. I could see President Trump being a little bit more focused on the Treasury Secretary and the Secretary of State, on the Secretary of Defense, than on, say, the Surgeon General. But it really matters, actually, that this woman was wrong about so many things on television, because the job of the Surgeon General is not to perform surgery. It's not like he's the president's physician or she is the president's president's physician. The Surgeon General is a spokesman for public health, the chief spokesman for public health in the country. So really, the only qualification for being the Surgeon General is to have a little bit of credibility, a little ethos in public health, and to get the information right, and to be able to present it in a way that is persuasive, but but accurate. And this woman completely failed on, on those fronts during the biggest test of our lifetime. So No knock on Trump. He's got a lot of jobs to fill up. I'm not even sure he was involved in picking this person, but this is a huge L, bad pick. She should be replaced. This is is just crazy. Now, getting to another unexpected pick, who I think actually could be pretty good, we get to the Treasury Secretary. And uh, this is one of the biggest roles in the government. The person that President Trump has picked is Scott Besant. Uh, This guy is a billionaire, He is a former employee of George Soros. He is openly homosexual. (laughs) He is, his uh, partner is a New York City prosecutor. Uh, Probably a lot of people did not have this on their bingo card. However, in this case, I think uh, Besant is probably a pretty good choice. He is pro-tariff. So he has come out there and defended tariffs, which is the most prominent and unusual aspect of President Trump's economic policy, but one on which he has campaigned for many years now and which might have helped push him over the finish line, especially with some parts of American labor in 2024. He's pro-tariff, but Wall Street also likes him. So you you would expect Wall Street to hate the pro-tariff guy because tariffs can harm some companies, especially companies that have nice, cozy relationships with uh, the government. However, in this case... Uh, Wall Street seems to like him. He's pushing tariffs, which means he would be willing to help any potential Trump war or trade policy, trade trade war, not like not shooting guns kind of war, but any kind of trade war, any kind of more aggressive negotiations with countries like China. All in all, I think it could be a pretty good pick because what it tells me is Trump this time around is going to be exactly as unpredictable as Trump was the first time around. And this was among his biggest political strengths, the unpredictability. Trump talks like a dove on foreign policy, but then he picks John Bolton to be his national security advisor. John Bolton, who is relatively belligerent and hawkish. Trump seems to be very pro-tariff, but then maybe he picks some guys who Wall Street likes. Trump says he wants world peace, then he drops the mother of all bombs in Syria. Trump threatens nuclear war with North Korea, but then actually goes and meets with Kim Jong-un. He's unpredictable. And uh, this story has been told as to why Vladimir Putin did not further invade a country under Trump's watch. He invaded Georgia under Bush's watch. He invaded Crimea under Obama's watch. Under Trump, he just kind of chilled. Then he further invaded into Ukraine on Biden's watch. Why? What, What is it about Trump? Trump said, if you invade Ukraine, I'll hit Moscow with bombs. And even if Putin only thought there were a 5% chance that that was really going to happen, you can't take that 5% risk. So this is, it's a zag for sure. 
billionaire in New York, homosexual George Soros employee. It's, it's weird for sure. But I think broadly, actually, Besant is probably aligned with the Trump policy. He's obviously extremely intelligent and accomplished. All in all, seems to me a pretty good pick. Then for attorney general, Matt Gates is out. He has formally pulled out of that race. We'll get to what happens next for Matt Gates in a moment. First, though, Trump installs Pam Bondi as his attorney general nominee. And even CNN, even the legal analyst for CNN had to admit this woman is eminently qualified. Pam Bondi is without a question qualified to be attorney general. She's been a prosecutor for 20 years in Florida. For eight of those, she was the attorney general of the state. That's a very big, very complicated job. And that level of experience is on par with or better than most United States attorneys general that we've seen over the past 50 years or so. On par with or better than most attorneys general that we've seen over the last half century. I think that is right. So what does it mean? Why why go through all these hoops? Why did we go through the whole Matt Gates charade? We'll get to that in a moment. First, I want to tell you about Jeremy's Razors. Go to jeremysrazors.com. I have here in my hand the Precision 5 Razor box right now. Look at how beautiful this is. Do you remember when Christmas was Christmas and razors were just razors? Well, the progressive Grinches running woke corporations are tearing down traditions. Jeremy's Razors is here to help save them. Our Black Friday deals are now live. You can save 30%. Stocking stuffers under 15 bucks. Shave hair and body bundles under 50 bucks. Plus, get free shipping on qualifying orders. Keep Christmas woke free. Order now at jeremysrazors.com. Give the man in your life a gift that they will not soon forget. jeremysrazors.com. See website for complete details. I was in a car to the airport in Nashville, and there's this great driver who has retired, unfortunately, but he's an older gentleman who's worked as a lawyer. He's had a long career and he does this kind of in, in his retirement, but he's conservative and has really smart thoughts on politics. So I get into the car during the Gates nomination and he says, now I got a question here. Why is it that Trump, President Trump picked Matt Gates? And I said, well, you tell me first before I give my view. They said, well, it seems to me Trump's a pretty smart guy. He might be doing that sort of thing where you are, where you are negotiating, where you're putting out a, a really provocative nominee to attract all of the attention and all of the controversy. And that way you can seem to concede by pulling him out, but then get through the person that you really want. I said, you know, that was my take as well. Whether this is a conscious or unconscious strategy, whether Trump is really gaming this all out in precision or if he just has a good political gut, I'm not really interested in that. What I care about is what is the effect of this? The effect of this is Trump's AG nominee, Pam Bondi, who's eminently qualified, is going to sail through confirmation. Would Trump's nominee have sailed through confirmation without the Gates fake out? I don't know. I'm not convinced of that. Now, it remains to be seen how hard the Democrats go after Pete Hegseth, Tulsi Gabbard, and Bobby Kennedy, who are now the public enemies one, two, and three for the Senate Democrats. But as, as of now, it seems to be working out well because Pam Bondi is certainly going to get in. What happens next to Matt Gates? There's a rumor going around that Matt Gates is going to serve in the next Congress. There's a rumor going around that Matt Gates only resigned from this Congress. But in the next Congress, he'll be able to serve, and it will be as though nothing happened. Uh, that is not true. Congressman Gates said in his resignation he does not intend to serve in any Congress in the future. He's, he's totally out. He is now on Cameo. Cameo is this app where you can go on, and there are various notables and celebrities, uh, and you, you can pay hundreds of dollars to request a personalized video from them. Get it for your buddy's birthday, for a bachelor party, get a pep talk, whatever. Uh, Matt Gates immediately, upon pulling out of the AG nomination process, he joined Cameo. He initially was charging 250 bucks a video. Now I think it's to over $500 a video, which is good, Matt. Don't sell yourself short. I think that's very smart. If we're going to be capitalistic here, I'm sure there's a, a pretty good demand for this. But the bio here says, I served in Congress. Trump nominated me to be U.S. Attorney General. That didn't work out once I fired the House Speaker. <laughs> and, and that's it. So it seems to me that the pivot here is to media. And this represents a broader shift in the way our political order works. 
the line between the media and the politicians has gotten blurrier than it was. There previously was a, a relatively firm line between the journalists and the politicians. Now, of course, the left never really respected that line, and the journalists were all activists, and they were really the propaganda arm for the politicians. They were much, much more closely enmeshed. For the conservatives, it was a little more rigid. You had the magazines and the conservative journalist outlets, and you had the elected politicians. Now I think people move in and out a little bit more. As journalism has come to take on the shape of influencing, and as podcasting has overtaken cable news and traditional media, it, it's a much more intimate environment. It's a much more personality-based kind of uh, environment. You're, you're no longer subscribing to the Wall Street Journal. You are subscribing to the Michael Knowles Show or the Ben Shapiro Show or the Matt Walsh Show. Or, you know, so it, it's it's much more personal. It, it bears greater similarities to politicians, and in this case, I think. Uh, Matt Gates is probably going to go out, maybe make a little bit of money in the media, start a podcast. That seems to be what every millennial white man in America is required by law to do at this point, is to have a podcast. So he'll do that. Doesn't mean he won't ever be in elected office again, but uh, people who are holding out hope that he'll get some other position in the Trump administration or that he'll be in Congress again or something, I think Gates is signaling he's not going to do that. Now, speaking of Congress... Now, speaking of education, I want to tell you about PragerU. Go to PragerU.com. Is America headed in the right direction? A majority of Zoomers support left-wing policies like open borders and socialism. If we do not reach them and change their minds, the country we know and love will be lost forever. PragerU is the leading nonprofit when it comes to influencing young people. Daily Wire has worked with PragerU for many, many years. I was, I think, the first... Prager Force spokesman, and I've done many five-minute videos, and I host a show, the book club over there, Prager U. So anyway, Prager U is educational, entertaining, pro-America videos. Meet young people where they are online and open their minds to the truth, but they need your help. Go to PragerU.com, make a tax-deductible donation. Whatever you give right now will be tripled and have three times the impact. Donate $10 by my math. That comes out to roughly between $29 and $31. Give $100. That triples to uh, somewhere between $299 and $301. PragerU is 100% free to everyone. No fees, no subscriptions. They don't rely on ads or clickbait headlines. Contrary to what the libs say, PragerU is not funded by a handful of billionaires. It's funded by people like you. In order to keep making great content, reaching millions, and changing minds, PragerU needs your help, rather. Make a 100% tax-deductible donation at PragerU today, and your gift will be tripled. Now, speaking of leftist institutions, where is it? I make one request of my producers today, which is to bring me my briefcase, and they don't do it. I'm sitting here all alone, which means I'm not going to be able to do my, my audition for MSNBC because my producers fell asleep in the control room. Well, I'll at least tell you the story. Donald Trump Jr., has, uh, was responding to a tweet that said, uh, Comcast is putting MSNBC up for sale. CNN just announced massive layoffs coming. Uh, maybe the new owners will figure out that lying nonstop to your audience is a lousy business model. And so Don Jr. tweets, he says, hey, Elon Musk, I have the funniest idea ever. <laughs> and what does Elon respond? Elon responds, how much does it cost? Now, does this mean... Is Elon seriously thinking about buying MSNBC? Actually, I think the story here is that if Comcast is going to spin off MSNBC, along with CNBC, E, Sci-Fi, USA, Oxygen, Golf Channel, Fandango, and Rotten Tomatoes, if they're going to spin it out into their own company, I actually think it won't be able to go up for sale. Uh, however, if Elon buys MSNBC, and Elon and Don Jr., I don't know, they do something together on this, and you need a replacement for Rachel Maddow, I'm just saying I know a guy. Maybe my audition would be a little bit more persuasive if I had my lesbian glasses on right now. I do not. You can use your imagination. Just putting it out there. Speaking of big shifts in communication, the uh, Florida Surgeon General has just come out and called to remove fluoride from the drinking water. Uh, this is going to seem like a minor story to a lot of people. However, I think this is actually a pretty big story. Uh, the Florida Surgeon General, Ladapo, I believe his name is, really serious guy. He was totally right during COVID. And he is affirming that conservatives who 
many decades ago, uh, complained about the addition of fluoride to the drinking water and were, were mocked as lunatics and freaks for, for doing so, that actually maybe those guys had a point. This was actually a central uh, plot point of Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Strangelove, in uh, this great Cold War movie in which the right-wing military man was complaining, was was giving his paranoid monologue on how the communists are trying to control our precious bodily fluids. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. Oh, ha, 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 look at that crazy, paranoid right-wing general, tee, hee, hee. Well, turns out the crazy right-wing caricature general in Dr. Strangelove appears to have been correct. That the precious bodily fluids thing is referring to the fluoridization of water. And Dr. Ladapo says, it is public health malpractice with the information that we have now to continue adding fluoride to water. Uh, the reason for this is the possibility of excessive fluoride exposure causing lower IQ levels and mental health issues among children. We now have a situation in which, what, one in four young boys are, are diagnosed with some kind of learning disability. I'm not saying it's because of the fluoride in water. I'm saying, at the very least, we can see a jump in uh, learning problems among uh, little kids. So there's, there's at least cause for some concern. In September, a recent federal judge in San Francisco made a ruling against the EPA that stated that fluoride in drinking water at the current recommended level of 0.7 milligrams per liter poses an unreasonable risk of hazard to child IQ because there's not enough of a margin of safety between the hazard level and the exposure level added to community drinking water. This is not just according to Dr. Ladapa. This is Dr. Ashley Milan, assistant professor with the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Florida. The scientific consensus now the leading scientific experts admit that fluoride in drinking water at the levels that we currently see it is dangerous, that we shouldn't have it, that all those cranks back in the 1950s and 60s who complained about this, that actually they were right. And this reminds me of a broader point. Forget about the water for a second. Forget about any particular political issue. This reminds me of a great line from Cardinal Manning who says, there is a day to come which will reverse the confident judgments of men. In that day, the first shall be last and the last first. The wise in this world will be fools and the fools in this world wise. The mad in this world will be the heirs of a better. Cardinal Manning, being a cardinal, is speaking here uh, eschatologically. He's speaking of ultimate religious matters. However, this is true on smaller points along the way. This is, this is a lesson that any basic political consultant or political observer can learn. Opinion, commonly accepted opinion, can reverse and can reverse very quickly. This is further proof of Fulton Sheen, or sometimes it's attributed to Dean Inge's observation, that uh, if you marry the spirit of this age, you will become a widow in the next. They're right. It's shifting. Six weeks ago, Trump was Hitler, and the people who supported him were white supremacists. Today, most Americans support Trump, and huge numbers of pretty much every single demographic in the country support Trump. Trump is now the mainstream candidate. MAGA is now the mainstream. Two years ago, we were told the Democrats were the party of science and the Republicans were the rubes who buried their head in the sand to oppose the science. Now on science, everywhere from castrating little kids to poisoning our drinking water <laughs> with unsafe levels of fluoride, the Republicans are the party who are siding with science, with the, the latest and most persuasive scientific discoveries. There is a day to come which will reverse the confident judgments of men. You know, our Daily Wire Plus Black Friday sale is live. Get 50% off new annual memberships right now. No code needed. Just head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and claim your new Daily Wire Plus membership for 50% off. With Daily Wire Plus, you get it all. Uncensored daily shows with limited ads, live breaking news you can trust, and premium entertainment. From the decade's number one documentary, Am I Racist, to exclusive series and hit movies, Daily Wire Plus offers it all and more. Your support makes this fight possible. Do not wait. Join the fight. 
and save 50% today. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. My favorite comment yesterday, it's from DAPV144. It says, 42-minute video explained in five minutes. Your name is now Michael Trolls. Now, now that is my name? You talk about now. Speaking of Dr. Strangelove, the Pentagon is now warning that North Korean troops are expected to enter combat soon in the war between Russia and Ukraine. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said over the weekend that thousands of North Korean troops currently stationed in Russia are expected to enter combat against Ukraine soon. He said this during a visit to Fiji. He said around 10,000 North Korean soldiers are believed to be in Russia's Kursk region near the border with Ukraine, where they are being integrated into Russian military formations because Russia's taken heavy losses in the war. This was a surprising announcement to me. And the reason this was a surprising announcement is because... I've known for, for well over a month, maybe multiple months at this point, that North Korean forces are currently fighting in the war. I, I sh- I, perhaps I shouldn't say I know with certainty. I've, just, I've heard now for well over a month from sources who are in positions to know that North Korean forces are already fighting in the war. The fact that the Pentagon is announcing this as though it's news, really shocking to me. But I guess a lot of people didn't know that this was happening. I've just uh, heard about it a little bit through the grapevine because there are, because Americans are fighting in this war too. And it, it's a reminder, I guess, for people who have not heard this or been paying close attention, that this is already resembling a world war. The war in Ukraine is a war between the United States and Russia. It always was. Russia's predicate for invading Ukraine was that the U.S. leading NATO had expanded beyond verbal agreements and promises uh, well into Russia's traditional sphere of influence. And that NATO is supposed to be a defensive alliance, but it keeps expanding. And that NATO has taken actions that are actually militarily aggressive or, or even preemptive, not merely defensive, not merely defending the members. And so you might say Vladimir Putin is a liar and an opportunist. He wants to rebuild the Soviet Union. All of that is probably true. But it was, a, it was a pretty strong predicate for going into Ukraine because NATO had been expanding, because the U.S. had been heavily involved in Ukrainian politics, because the director of the CIA did arrive in Kiev two weeks after the Maidan revolution, because Ukraine, having been a buffer state for a long time, was increasingly shifting toward the West. And uh, Russia didn't like that. And now the, the region is at war. Then you add on to that, Joe Biden gives the okay for for Ukraine to use American missiles to seriously escalate the war. It's not as though Ukraine can just push a button and the missiles fire off. The United States is very actively involved. The United States is the only reason Ukraine can continue to fight because we're arming them and giving them a ton of money. So already you've got two powers that fought a Cold War for 50 years. Uh, Those two powers are getting closer and closer to hot combat. Then you add into that the fact that you've, you've got North Korean troops coming in on the side of the Russians. All of a sudden, this is beginning to resemble a world war. And, and you have top-ranking Ukrainian officials who are saying it already is a world war. Things can spin out of control very quickly. And so Trump gets elected. People say, okay, good. We got the peace president back. We're going to restore the, the world peace that we had in Trump's first term. Maybe. Two months is a long time. And, and to quote Barack Obama, you should never underestimate Joe Biden's ability to screw things up. I'm cleaning up Obama's statement. Speaking of violence, you want to see why Elon and Don Jr. have to buy MSNBC, why it would be so funny for me to replace Rachel Maddow. The headline on MSNBC following the trial of Lake and Riley's killer, Lake and Riley, that young American university student who was murdered and nearly by an illegal alien, an illegal alien who, uh, who found an open border, a, a border that was open because the Democrats intentionally opened it. Here's the headline from MSNBC. Lake and Riley's killer never stood a chance. Lake and Riley's killer never stood a chance for all the political controversy surrounding Jose Ibarra. The outcome of this trial was never in doubt. Now, mind you, the, the reason the outcome of this trial was never in doubt is because he murdered this girl and tried to murder her. That's why. And we had such overwhelming evidence that there was no doubt in anyone's mind. Who would you say is the victim here? The the American university student who was nearly 
attacked and who was murdered by an illegal alien who had no right to be in this country, or the aforementioned illegal alien? Who would you say is the victim? Because the MSNBC headline portrays the murderer as the victim, par for the course. He was found guilty on all charges. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is fine, I guess. It seems, uh, seems like they could have gone a little harsher, but okay. Uh, this, this girl fought for 18 minutes to stop this guy from killing her, and then she killed him. He is a complete animal, a com- truly a complete degenerate animal who has, to my knowledge, expressed no remorse or repentance whatsoever and happily will receive some modest modicum of punishment here. But, but th- th- let this serve as a lesson, lesson, two lessons really. This is illegal immigration. This guy is illegal immigration. And the media are on his side. MSNBC takes his side. The Biden administration takes his side. That's why they open the border for him. And the Democrats are responsible for Lake and Riley's murder and attempted murder. The Democrats are responsible for that. That's not hyperbole. That is a fact. It's an inescapable fact. Democrats are responsible for Lake and Riley's murder in a way that conservatives are generally not responsible for negative and unintended consequences of our policies. And here's why. Here is why the Democrats bear responsibility and the Republicans don't. Conservatives, as a rule, approach political issues from the standpoint of uh, virtue ethics or deontological ethics, from more traditional ethical frameworks that say that it is wrong to do something that is evil or false or uh, morally sus. Okay, so the, the Democrats do not. The Democrats take a more consequentialist or utilitarian approach to ethics. So to, to bring that really down to earth, the conservatives say it is not acceptable to commit evil actions to achieve good ends. The, the leftists say the ends justify the means. As a matter of their actual, frequently, openly stated ethical views. So for a conservative, it's perfectly possible that I, I could have good intentions, I could make a correct moral calculation, but given the fallenness of this world, something goes awry and some negative consequence happens. Someone dies, someone is injured, some bad thing happens. I would not bear all that much responsibility for that fact. Because I am not attempting to calculate all of the potential outcomes and recreate my own morality around the the perfection of my reason and the perfection of my will, my own omnipotence, okay? I'm just trying to do the right thing, and sometimes things go wrong. For the Democrats, the Democrats are actively cooperating with evil, the evil of ignoring our immigration laws, the evil of permitting an invasion of our country, the evil of permitting a mass poisoning of our country, the evil of letting rapists and murderers in, the evil of allowing gangsters, in some case Satan-worshipping gangsters like MS-13, to control the southern border. They are knowingly cooperating with that evil because they think it will achieve some good end. They think the good end of, well, having a permanent electoral majority is really the end they're seeking, but also the good end of allowing the poor Venezuelans to come to America and seek a better life. They're just making that calculation. They're saying, we're going to do a little bit of evil, but it's going to ultimately redound to the greater good. So it, it doesn't, first of all. But second of all, they therefore bear responsibility for the evil that occurs, the evil like the near and the certain murder of Lake and Riley. They bear responsibility. Next time you're tempted to vote for a Democrat, look at this animal. These are the people that they welcome into our country and that they defend after they're found guilty of murder. Okay, speaking of good, goodness, fight between good and evil, I have Coach Bill Courtney coming on the show to tell you not to be a turkey man. The rest of the show continues now. You do not want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada WLAS, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. 